All right, the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He's to be feared above all gods. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Only one God. He's the only one that has immortality. And one mediator. All things were made by God Almighty, who was the Father. The only one that is self-existent. The only one. There's only one person that is self-existent. And that is God, who is also the Father. And there's no other being. That's the teaching of the Bible, the majority teaching. Majority teaching is that the one who sits on the throne, which is talked about in the book of Revelation, is God. And he has created all things, everything. Not just most things or some things, but everything. And he's created it for his pleasure and for his purpose and for himself, by himself, He's done it alone. It says he did it alone, not with the help of Jesus. So that's the opposite. Now, I'm talking Isaiah. I'm talking the book of Revelation. And, of course, we have the first part of John. It says that somehow Jesus did it all. <laughs> well, that's a total contradiction. And then eventually I'll be talking about what Paul said. Paul said that Jesus created everything. But then all other times he said things that contradicted that. In fact, I'm going to talk about one verse today where he gives God the glory as the, it's a short little statement, but I, I included it because he really said the right thing. So here we are at the uh, 18th part of the false doctrine of Paul. And I'm reading through the book of Acts, 18th part of the book of Romans, false doctrine. And these verses right here I had to include because they're in Acts, they're not in Romans, but this, this is a very strange this is a very, very strange uh, story here. And then after it, well, I'll tell you what happened after it. I'm just going to tell you. I'm not going to read it. Let me read this, and I'm just going to say a few things about it. Acts 16, 16 through 20. And it came to pass, as he went to prayer, that was Paul, doesn't say, it should say. But as he went to pray, a certain damsel, that's all it says, just a certain damsel. So in other words, a female, a young female. And it says that she was possessed with a spirit of divination. Possessed with a spirit of divination met us. Well, that's interesting. So it says met us. So the, the writer of a book of Acts, which is basically unknown, was with Paul. Because we don't really know who wrote uh, the book of Acts. We don't know for sure. They, people have theories, but it came with Luke, but that's all they know. It says, which brought her masters her masters. So apparently they try, they're trying to say that somehow she was a slave or something. I have a problem with that too. If she had a, if she had a spirit of like a supernatural gift, then, you know, how'd she end up being a slave? And then not just her master, but her masters. What's that all about? <laughs> we have no clue. It says, her master is much gained by sooth saying. Okay. So then it says, the same followed Paul. So this girl followed Paul. 
and then it says and us. Okay, so there's an us there, but we don't know who that uh, who who that was. Uh, well, it's not named. I mean, maybe if you read previously, you can get an idea. But then it says and cried, or said, saying, "These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show to us the way." Of salvation. Well, that's good, right? That is a good thing. If they were going to be introduced to a crowd, that's what they would say. They'd say, today we have Paul, the preacher, and he is a servant of the Most High God, and he's going to show us the way to be saved, the way of salvation. Well, that's somebody who's with God, supposedly. If Paul is with God, then and the person of the we're talking here about the young girl is saying that Paul is with God, then they're in harmony. They're they are in agreement. So the girl is with Paul. She's with him. She's for him. She believes he's a real minister, a real preacher. She's totally affirming his legitimacy. You say, well, great, great. Everything's great. No, everything was not great. Because then it says in 18, and this did she many days, so she kept doing that. We can only assume a lot of things here that, you know, because you have to, people have tried to make sense out of this. So then they, they'll say, well, the person was like, maybe they were obnoxious. Other versions were saying that she shouted. But here it just says she cried. In other words, she spoke. I, you know, what, what's that supposed to mean? Except she, you know, so she said it loudly, whatever. She was, the, so the spirit, there's supposedly a demon spirit in this girl, right? So a demon spirit is going around and saying uh, positive things about a preacher of God. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, it makes the devil into this particular spirit into a fool. I mean, I mean, ignorant, stupid. I mean, uh, because why would they do that? Uh, because they are supposed to be opposed to the work of God. So why would why would some devil right go around and promote the work of God? Doesn't make any sense. So it says in this did she many days, but Paul being grieved. Grieved? Why? Why was he grieved that she was agreeing? She was like a voice for him. She was a advocate for him. She was promoting him. She was affirming his, his anointing, his supposed anointing. So that's odd. Uh, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit. So why does it have to be a spirit? I mean, did, didn't the woman have her, her own mind? And said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And, and it says, and he came out the same hour. The same hour? I mean, it took an hour? <laughs> That doesn't make any sense. And then it says, And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone. Oh, really? So, so supposedly the woman was like, but doesn't say anything about, you know, there's no interview with the woman. There's no other information about, you know, why and how and what. But then it just says, they caught Paul and Silas, and then they grabbed. 
supposedly these people wither, you know, these masters. They claim that there was some kind of masters, uh, like that she was some kind of a servant. It makes no sense to me. And then they got aggravated, supposedly, because she didn't. So what did, how did they know that she even lost her gift? How did they even know? Well, we're not told. And then threw him into the marketplace. It says, and drew them into the marketplace, the King James, to the rulers. You know, and, and why did they allow themselves to be, you know, to be, uh, I mean, he, he's there with a crowd. He's preaching to a crowd or he's with people. There's a bunch of people with him. And so who were these guys, these masters of some girl that supposedly had some supernatural power? Why were they allowed to forcibly take them and put them into some kind of a uh, police station or something? And, and you know. I mean, I would have resisted. It would have been a brawl. It says, and brought them to the magistrates. Well, how did they manage that? Paul must have had, a, had some people with him. It doesn't make any sense. And it says, uh, saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. So anyway, I just wanted to bring bring that up because, you know, Jesus said that he that is for us is not against us. So this spirit was for Paul. It almost like it's almost like saying Paul wasn't of God, right? Because this spirit, if you really believed, if you really believed that this spirit was a devil, right, then Paul was not of God. Because the devil was affirming, he was trying to say that Paul was of God. Well, did devils go around and say that people of God are of God? No. No, they don't. They do not. They do not. So if you do believe he was uh, a devil that was in this girl, then the devil was happy with the false doctrine of Paul and was affirming it. He was supporting it. They're calling it a he. So the, the devil was affirming and supporting the false doctrine of Paul. That's one theory. So then we go to... So then we go to Romans 14.9. Now we're back to Romans. And this is just an interesting contradiction here. Um, you know, we don't have really too many de too much detail on both of these statements. And on the other hand, they clearly contradict each other, the words of Paul, the words of Jesus. Paul said on uh, Romans 14, 9, For to this end Christ both died and rose, and revive this repetition there. If he rose, he revived. Why are you repeating yourself? Well, that could be the translators doing that. But when you raise, when you raise up, when you rose, if he rose from the dead, he revived. It says that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. So here, Paul is saying that Christ was the Lord of the dead. It just doesn't have a nice ring to it, you know, it doesn't sound right. You could say that Paul was saying here that he's the God of the dead. That doesn't sound right. And Jesus said the opposite in Matthew twenty-two thirty-two. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead. 
but of the living. So here, I mean, Jesus wasn't... Um, i got to look at the context on this. Yeah, so Jesus is quoting God. He's saying, did not God say, and then he said, I am the God of Abraham. But the key is that it's clearly the opposite statement. We see it says that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And then Paul is saying that he is the God of the dead. So take it for what it's worth. Then we have uh, two verses ahead, same chapter 14. Uh, verse 11, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. This is an interesting contradiction. I'm going to show you what it says in Isaiah. This is where it comes from Isaiah. And then Isaiah says in Isaiah 45, 23, I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth. I just noticed something. It's, it's interesting. Interesting that it says, I have sworn by myself. In other words, he's not a team. He's not part of a team of gods. He's his self. He's by himself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That, to me, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. And so, you know, you look at the, the, the statement of Paul and you say, well, who is speaking here? Because the last part of this verse, he's talking in the third person. For it is written, as I live. Notice it's being quoted wrong, obviously. There's a lot of that going on in the New Testament where they quote the Old Testament wrong. Just quote it. Not the, not the same way we have it. Not the same... Uh, way it's translated in our Bibles. That's for sure. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Well, I thought God was speaking here. You see? If it was God speaking, if this is correct, I mean, this is just incorrect, the statement here, 14.11 in Romans. Because if, if the statement was correct, it would say, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to me. And every tongue shall confess to me. But it says, it says, every tongue shall confess to God, as if the person that's speaking is not God. So it doesn't make any sense. It's, no, it doesn't make any sense. And it's very clear what he's saying here. You know, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. And that he's saying that it's come out of his mouth and so forth. So then we look at uh, a few verses up, Romans 14. And this is a standalone statement. 14, 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. I don't No, that's not true. But to him that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So what is he saying? He's saying that it's according to what you want, not according to the commandments of God, but according to what you believe is wrong and what you believe is so this is really talking about food, I believe. And yeah, this is a clear, this whole section, I didn't include it, but it's, it, it goes on and on and on. It's very annoying. It goes on and on and on about meat. In other words, that means food. And it's talking about, you know, what's 
because of the the Old Testament had a lot of rules and regulations about what was unclean to eat and what was not unclean. There was all kinds of things that God said were unclean, all kinds of animals, all kinds of creatures that were unclean. You, I could read the whole chapter. It goes on and on and on. And then, um, and then we get over here in the New Testament. It's like a different God, okay? Uh, and Paul was saying this a lot, I think. He says this a lot through his writings, you know, that nothing is unclean. Even Peter was saying that because he saw that sheet come down, all the animals. But I just read that. I already read that in Acts. And I don't think it meant, it, it didn't necessarily mean that you could do that. Uh, it meant that it, it, it was supposed to be talking about people. It, it didn't say specifically. In other words, it said that if God cleansed something, in other words, if he cleansed the Gentiles, then they were clean. Because he didn't want to, he didn't think that the gospel should be given to Gentiles. So he showed the animals to come down in the in the vision, and then he says, "What God has cleansed, don't consider unclean." But he didn't. That didn't mean that he was going to cleanse all the animals. That's a revelation. I when I came to that conclusion, because you have to you have to figure out what that really means. You have to integrate. You have to resolve the seeming contradiction there. But he used that as an example, but did not say, and now you may eat all animals. No, he just said, if God were to cl cleanse all those animals, which he's not, there's no commandment where he says, I will cleanse, them. just pray over them, that's what the New Testament teaches. That all they have to do is pray over all these creatures now, and then they'll all you can eat, you know, uh, creeping things, and you can eat all kinds of things that were uh, listed as not being good to eat, and then all you have to do is pray over them, and then they're good. Well. He didn't say that he was going to do that. He just used that as an example. If he were to cleanse all these four-footed beasts and so forth, then they would be clean. And it, and that would be the same way, that's the same way with people. If he does cleanse the people, then they're clean. And that has been made possible by Jesus because he has given himself an offering for sin. Life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. And so Jesus has given himself an offering for sin on the altar of the cross, and everybody needs an atonement, everybody needs a Passover. And that's how that works. And so once again, what he's really saying is that, you know, the laws of the Old Testament are not in effect anymore. And he's saying that if you think it's unclean, then it is. And if you think it's not unclean, then it's not unclean, which is in total opposition of the Old Testament writings. And lastly, Romans sixteen twenty five. Uh, and 27, but I think they, they have a separate message. 25, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. I put this down because it's very interesting. Interesting. Most of these versions will say, they will have it read that way, my gospel. So Paul is saying it's his gospel. He didn't say it's the gospel of God. He didn't say it's the gospel of Christ. He said, it's my gospel. And so that sort of agrees with his, with the false doctrines that he was 
always uh, saying is that it was his gospel, not God's. But then he does say, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, which he certainly did do that. He certainly did preach his Jesus. He had his own Jesus, you know. Uh, and he, he was preaching the right Jesus sometimes, and then other times he was not. So he was a little mixed up. He was confused. He was very mixed up, I should say. So he, he was right, and he was uh, clear in his mind sometimes, and then other times he was saying the opposite. This is according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. just wanted to read the rest of that verse. And it really wasn't kept secret because it was in the Old Testament. All the, the events that happened were there. It wasn't totally in secret. It wasn't kept secret, totally secret. We can always use more detail, but we usually have sufficient amount of information to make a determination about uh, certain things, about doctrine. And then lastly, I want to include this verse because it just is correct, you know. And I don't hear this enough of modern Christians. Verse 27, to God only wise, see, to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Uh, the rest of it's just a lot of general information about who sent it. Written to the Romans from Corinthus, Corinthus and sent by Phoebe, servant of church, whatever. And he goes on and on a lot with, with meaningless information. And, you know, probably never knew those letters were going to be published and printed millions of times. But there was meaningless, you know, a lot of pages of just pretty uh, meaningless writings. But I like this because it says, to God who is only wise, if I was to paraphrase it, to God who is the only one who is wise, because he's, Jesus said he was the only one that is good. So he's the only one that is wise also. To him be the glory. It doesn't say that they're getting equal glory. You see? Because all the modern churches, so many of them, I, I don't know what the percentage exactly is, but it's amazing how many modern church groups have written in their beliefs that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost all get equal glory. Equal, equal glory. That is what they say. That is what they teach. I don't know if they teach it, but they have it written in their beliefs. I don't think they even teach the Bible, m many of them. They don't even know how to. If they did, if they really knew the Bible, they wouldn't have such a s ignorant, uh, naive, uh, unbiblical statement. But they're just parroting what other churches are, are saying. See, they don't even question it because they don't even know themselves what's in the Bible. And so Tom, Dick, or Harry's church has that. And they are starting. They're in the business. They're getting into the business of religion. And so they say, oh, that must be true. They know. No, they do not know. Because here, at least we have the truth. To God be the glory through Jesus Christ. It doesn't say, it doesn't say to God only wise be glory and Jesus also be glory. Also equal glory. No. No, no, no.